I'm joined today by Lisa Goldberg, who has many talents, so I'm discovering, <laughs> one of which is an inspiring cook. Cook, chef, cook. Cook. She's brought with her today, and I'm the lucky recipient, I get to taste, um, ginger snap biscuits. Actually, honey snap. But honey they snap. do have ginger in them, so okay. not Honey ginger. snap in yeah. honour of the upcoming Rosh Hashanah. Yeah. So, firstly, tell me a bit about biscuits. Biscuits. Who doesn't love biscuits? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is one of the great joys of life. And what I love is a biscuit that's really easy to make like this. Mm -hmm. So, ingredients in, you know, wet ingredients, dry ingredients, mix it together, make a dough, roll it out, cookie cutter, 10 minutes in the oven. Yeah. And these are perfect for Rosh Hashanah. Okay. You know? And are they your go-to? They are because they're quick and easy to make. Okay. They are delicious with a cup of tea, but we've also got, in another book, a soft version of that, like a soft honey biscuit, okay. which is also quite alluring in a way. Yeah, no, I'm a crunchy girl. Um, I'm just, I'm just going to so snap one think. for the sake of... <laughs> Definitely snappy. Definitely snappy. Just honey, bit of spice. Yeah. These are the sort of things you bake and you just smell Rosh Hashanah in mm. your whole house. You know that smell of it's honey? Not... Yeah, I'm getting very, very subtle ginger and spice but the honey is coming through they're yeah. beautiful yeah thank you thank you i'll finish it afterwards so i can actually carry on a conversation <laughs> so okay so they're part of your go-to type um routine for rosh hashanah yeah Do, are you the sort of person who prepares have you worked out ahead of time what's on the menu are you a traditionalist are you coming up with you know inspired new things that change it up yeah. a bit i'd love to tell you that i plan three months ahead but everything's new and inspired with some tradition thrown in that's what I'd love to say. But the truth is, I got an email the other day saying, can we have a recipe for Rosh Hashanah? And then I went into a panic that Rosh Hashanah is so close. I looked at my calendar and went, when is it? When is it? That's where I'm up to now. <laughs> and I haven't gone hosting? much further. Yeah, I am hosting. But um, I have to say, I'm truly a traditionalist. Okay. And what I love about tradition, um, and I feel like Tevye and I should really break into yeah. that song right now, is that... We can grow up with these traditions in our house, like the chicken soup, or for me, the egg and onion on a Friday night. Mm -hmm. And we can keep those traditions going for us and our kids, and then hopefully our grandkids one day. Um, but it's the recipes that we create during our lives, like in our generation, that we pick up from someone, like a friend's chocolate cake yeah. or something, and that becomes our own new tradition, like it might be the yeah. birthday or something for a Sunday mm -hmm. brunch. And I love those as well. So what we have this saying, and it doesn't really make any sense because um, I don't think two of the words aren't real, but we like to say that we um, contemporise the traditional yes, and we traditionalise the contemporary. contemporary yeah, it's and same. so that's, to me, that encompasses all aspects of it. So for me, my Rosh Hashanah is going to be the traditional, um, my mother's brisket. My mother mm -hmm. makes or used to make this amazing brisket um, it was a, a veal brisket, so a very small piece of brisket on the bone. Mm -hmm. It's quite hard to get. Yeah. Um, and then you, uh, you cover it in lots and lots of onions and, of course, lots and lots of oil and salt. Yes. And you roast it for three or four hours. And it becomes this delectable, I can't yeah. even describe, yeah. fall off the bone, yep. amazing meat that is just to die for. And so that I would like to try and make every year when you can get it. Yes. Um, but then there's my Auntie Myrna's Simmers. She makes yes. sweet carrots. That's that right. is fantastic. It That's is in one of your books. Um, yeah, it yes. is. It's, it's, so it's made with um, sliced carrots in the shape of coins, you mm -hmm. know, for a, for a prosperous and sweet new year. And she cooks the carrots, or she used to cook the carrots, and then she she boiled them, I think, with, I've got to remember, I think, yeah. honey, a bit of ginger, yes. sugar. And then you cook them. It's really interesting. You boil them on the stove until all the water goes. Yes. And the carrots become Caramel. so sweet yeah. and so plump. It's actually an extraordinary transformation. Yeah. So you're not boiling them in lots of water yes. and tossing out the water. You're reducing yes. it. And then, best part is you put them in a roasting pan with butter or margarine if you want it curry. Yeah. And you then roast them some more. Wow. And then they okay. start to caramelise and get very buttery. Yes. And... That's how you serve. But what I've done is I've now added some, I thought it needs something more. Yeah. So I've added, I wanted to put like a dumpling or a pasta or something in that. Yeah. And so I, we have a recipe in our first book for something called nokadli. And those of you yeah. who have a Hungarian back background will understand or Austrian, it's like a little noodle. Really mm -hmm. great and really fun and easy to make. So I've put in those freshly made nokadli, some prunes, yeah. a little bit more butter, some of the juice from cooking the carrots. Yeah. 
and then you roast that together. And oh, that yeah. is a side dish. And honestly, I made it last yeah. Rosh Hashanah for the first time. And I've been dreaming and salivating about yeah. it ever since. Do you find, I often find, you know, we've all got these amazing um, recipes that have handed down or that we fondly remember. And you just can't replicate that exact, right. you know, there's something that's missing. And you'll talk about, you know, a great grandmother or a great auntie or whoever, yeah, yeah. you know, they made amazing biscuits or they made, as you say, whatever it is, it's yeah, simmers or yeah. whatever it is. And you can try and replicate it and there's always that one thing missing. What is it? And, I know, and, I know. And whether, I mean, in today's day and age, it might be our utensils. It might be, you know, yeah. the differences in yeah. oils and fats and, um, you know, they were using the real fat. Well, um, I, sometimes I think, like my mother and my late mother-in-law used to make incredible schnitzels, like just a yeah. plain chicken schnitzel. Yeah. But she had something mm -hmm. in it yeah. that we can't replicate. Yeah. And we don't know yeah. what it is. But what I think it was is something like garlic salt from a yes. jar. I think it's something like something, that. And I yeah. think they did in that generation, particularly I think my mother's generation, used all those jars from the supermarket of garlic salt and celery salt and onion created. salt, and they created those yeah. flavours from it. Yes. And I think that's something that, that I don't really use so much no. of, and maybe that's the secret. Yeah, maybe. Which, which brings me to the books and... I want to touch on the books and, and understand because when you talk about tradition and getting people's stories, that's what blew me away when I first read the first book and what's grabbed me every time you've released now four books. Um, I've loved reading people's Thank stories you. and the history behind it and the traditions and I love that that's getting passed on um, in a lot of these instances that may not otherwise have been passed on. But for people that don't know, where did the inspiration, so the title Monday Morning Cooking Club, and where did the inspiration, it's a big jump to go from, you know, a home cook and yeah, enjoying yeah. making things to suddenly coming out with not one, but subsequently yeah, yeah. ending up with four recipe books. Um, I love the way you said suddenly, you know, it's like an overnight <laughs> success. No. Okay, so <laughs> the first book took us five years, yeah. five years for one book, because we went from not knowing anything and having no idea about how, how to do it. How long did you think it would take when you started? Didn't think, just okay. started and realised it was taking a really long time. Okay. Five years. And then each book after that took three years. So I've written yeah. four books all together. Yeah. Um, so we've been going for, I think, 17 years now. So it's been really oh, a long time. I was thinking and, when was the first one. And was a long, about 15, yeah, a yeah. long process. The first book came out in 2011. Okay. And we got together 2006. So oh, it wow. started when um, my friend Natanya Eskin, she came, we used to play basketball together and you know, it's a joke because we're both, I mean, I'm five foot tall. Right? So it's a joke, but we actually did. In our 40s, we decided to like re resume that basketball career that we had at school. And we had the best fun of all. It was unbelievable. So so a bunch of us um, over 40s, our, our team was called Storm in a D Cup. And um, it was it. hilarious. And we had a ball. And we actually, I want to tell you, we were in Division E, which was the bottom. And in the second season, we won it. And we won a pizza voucher. <laughs> the irony and we had a, where you ended up. <laughs> I just think we had a coach. This has got nothing to do with it, yeah. and, and I'm sure you'll cut it out. But um, we, <laughs> we had a coach, and um, we gave him the pizza voucher as a thank you. But I'm actually full of regret. We should have just given him the money for the pizza and framed the voucher. Absolutely. So that's now gone. Yes. <laughs> um, but on the same note is that I wish that we had, I wish that we'd actually filmed that basketball yeah. career, that time in the basketball e-grade because it was hilarious. Yeah. But I wish we'd filmed the Monday Morning Cooking Club story because from where we started, so Natanya, who I played basketball with, approached me one day and said, we both love to cook and talk food. And she said, let's write a cookbook for charity. And I said, okay, sure, let's talk about it. So we started talking about it. And we decided we're happy to do a book, but we didn't want to do, um, you know, we all did as kindy mums, those beautiful ring binder books with everyone's favourite. You know, it'd be Amanda's chocolate slice and Lisa's mm -hmm. cheesecake and all that. And we love those books and I think they've got a really good place. But we wanted to do a book that could sit on a bookshelf in any bookstore next to anybody's cookbook. That was what oh, we wanted right. to do. Um, at the time we had Borders, which mm. was this incredible bookshop and they had a whole section of cookbooks and we used to go in there and say, that's where we want it to sit. So yeah. that was where we started. I mean, I don't know if that's the right sort of aim, but that's, that was the beginning. And we sat down and we talked about what we wanted to do and what we wanted to put in the book. And we knew we wanted to tell the story of our community mm. because the Jewish community is, you know, obsessed with food. We know that it's always about the food. Or well, for me anyway, and yeah. for my family. Me too. And uh, for many people. <laughs> and we wanted to tell that story. 
so at the same time we wanted to collect the recipe so if i come to your place for afternoon tea yeah. and you make me a um you know an almond cake and i love it and i ask you for the recipe mm -hmm. you give it to me and that becomes then a recipe that i make they're the recipes that we wanted the ones that everybody wants from everyone else yeah. so we thought how do we collect those recipes uh, and then while we were collecting the recipes, we thought we also want the stories that go with mm. them. Um, we wanted to preserve recipes from the older generation before they were lost. And that's something that was very close to all our hearts. We all have a story of, of like an auntie or a grandmother who used to make something and we didn't have the recipe. Mm. Or we had the recipe but didn't understand it. Yes. Um, so all of those things became part of the book and we would sit around the table um, we started to meet on Monday mornings. I don't know why we picked Mondays because actually it's the worst day of the week to do <laughs> to anything. Because yes. think about it, you know, Monday morning you do, you've got to get everything done and organise things for the week. But no, 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 we thought we'll meet. Um, so then we had the stress of, you know, who's going to do the shopping for what they're cooking. Yeah. And anyway, we managed it and we became the Monday morning cooking club. A journalist friend of um, one of the one of my co-authors actually suggested it one day okay she said you girls should be the monday morning cooking club and we went Stop. we like that we'll take it and how did you get the others beyond the two of you into it uh, natanya and i started yeah and then we had um lauren fink who was a week so girl who came in friend of mine and then um kerry filler was involved and judy lowe was involved and sort of they were sort of in and then they decided to go and then we decided we needed to gather more. And then there was a knock at the door, not literally, but it's a good story. <laughs> and it was Marilyn Chalmers with a tray of freshly toasted cheese sandwiches that she'd made for us. And said, I'm here. We had a bite and said, come on in. So she came in with her toasted sandwiches. So we still talk about those sandwiches. They were really good. And then we invited Paula Horwitz in because we needed someone who could sort of do the business side of things. Because we realised if we're selling books, I'm not such a, um, I don't have such a business head mm -hmm. and we needed someone with that slant. Lauren was in because she was involved on the charity side. Mm -hmm. Marilyn for the cooking, Natanya and I sort of started it. And Jackie Israel, who was there from the very beginning, who I should have started with, because she came on board first with Natanya and said that she wanted to do like the minutes and, and like do those logistic things that we needed and that she was happy to give us six months. Okay, so 16 years later, she's, <laughs> she's still, still there. doing all your admin and helping. Okay. So we all came with a different, there were six yep. of us in the beginning. Um, and we sat down and thought, okay, well, how on earth do we write this book? Mm. And the hardest part, obviously, collecting recipes. We wrote to everybody we knew. Yeah, I mean, so you was, started with your... Yeah, we started... With, we decided the first book was going to be Sydney. Yep. Um, and we... You know, I laugh when I think back of how we did it back then, but it was a long time ago yeah. and even, even internet was different and, yeah. and social media was really non-existent yeah. um, for us. And so we emailed everybody we knew and we said, okay, we're, we're putting together these recipes. Who's the best cook you know? Can you tell us? Or if, you're, if you think you're, you know, you're a cook, tell us your favourite recipes and the recipes your family loves. So we decided, in our wisdom, that if someone got three nods from different people in the community that they would go into the yes pile, right? Okay. So that's how it started. And then it evolved. And also things like, you know, if I'd eaten something at someone's house yeah. or um, something from my family, we all put things in from our families. Yes. They went into the running. Okay. And then we had a series of folders. And back then it was actually a, a, a hardcover folder with paper. Mm -hmm. Now we're on Google Drive, thank yes. goodness. Um, Yes, no, maybe. Okay. And of course it moved around and we would get together every Monday and we'd test the recipes. Okay. And, you know, fast forward, fast forward, we got together a manuscript, which we thought was, not a manuscript, sorry, a um, mock-up mm -hmm. of, of the book, which had a front cover and photos. And we thought it was the best thing we'd ever seen. And if I showed it to you now, you'd just go, <laughs> like, oh, God, what were you thinking? Why were we thinking? We thought it was... We were so proud of it. I shouldn't put that down because we no, were so proud you know, of it. Everything was in that font that everyone used in those days, Comic yeah. Sans, yes. like the whole thing was in Comic <laughs> Sans, um, which says it all, yes. right? <laughs> um, and then we took it round to publishers and that's when the serious stuff started. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really hard because we decided that we would... Um, go to a publisher and then wait for the response before going to the next publisher. If I had my time again, oh. we'd just go out to all the publishers and yeah. whatever, but we didn't. We, and so it took us a year and we went out to all these publishers and at the end of the year, 
Um, we went to the three major cookbook publishers in Australia and we got a no, no and a no. Mm -hmm. And it was devastating. It was, I remember where I was when I got the final no. And, and these were people who they saw the, the, the mock-up and they would say, love it, love the idea, think it's fantastic. And then they all came back with no's. And it was just it's so hard. sad. And so luckily one of them introduced us to Hardy Grant Custom Publishing. Mm -hmm. And gave me a number of someone to call who was expecting my call. Now, I was then so excited about that. And that was, you know, even though we were going to pay for it. So we're actually yeah. being, in, you know, gave us the entitlement to buy something. Woohoo. But I was excited that at least there was a foot in the door somewhere. So in the end, we went with Hardy Grant and we custom published, mm -hmm. which meant that we had to fund it ourselves. Um, it actually worked out really, really well. We did it um, in... we. We did it ourselves, but we so we're going to be the beneficiaries of the funds um, in the beginning from that book. And that really helped us because they gave us an audience straight away. So yeah. we knew that as soon as we published the book, we could sell a few thousand copies without blinking. Yeah. We had a whole um, financial plan, which miracle of miracles actually worked. <laughs> um, I can't yeah. believe how it worked. We, we each put in some money. We got a friend to put in some as well. And... We had to make three payments and by the end of the second payment the book was released and the third payment we had funds coming in and we could all be repaid and, and there and you go. Out. Um, we decided it would be a charitable project from the beginning mm -hmm. so that 100% of all profits from all sales of the books go to charity. Um, Has it been really a consistent forever. charity it's been all No, if you look at our, our website we've got like about 30 charities that okay. we've given to in the, in, in, throughout. Um, different ways some people some charities we've actually given money to mm -hmm. um, others we've given books to sell so that they can have the money so yeah. there's different ways and it's been it's been that's been a joyous part of it and people ask me often about the charity side of it and I and I always say to me it's it's the icing on the cake yeah. it was never the reason for doing it yes the reason for doing these books was to tell the story of this community. yeah and, and that's that's yeah. really what yeah. it feels like is at the heart of it, is, is that you are capturing stories. You know, we talk about things like um, the Jewish Museum or the Holocaust Museum and capturing stories and documenting um, stories. And I feel like in such a beautiful and fun way, um, an engaging you. way, you've, you've really captured people's stories. So did you, I mean, obviously you weren't, you were all bringing recipes to the table, as you said, and, and from people, you know, friend of a friend and whoever did you engage you know when you read did you get to know everybody's story individually did it become start to mean something to you individually yeah absolutely and that was the greatest joy I think for all of us through this process was meeting the people or meeting the families of the people some you know had passed away mm. and getting to know them and the family and their story and how I'm going to say this is pulling a number out of yeah. off the top of my head but I'm going to say 70% of people learnt to cook because they suddenly found themselves married having to do a Friday night mm. dinner and so they went oh, I, I need to learn how to cook yeah. so either at their mother's knee or their mm -hmm. grandmother's knee they stood and they learnt and they then did it themselves and um, the stories are just beautiful and we were very um, connected to some more you know some in particular yeah. but particularly with the first book because it yes. was Sydney based yes so we could actually um, meet everybody in the yes. book but um, can I tell you a story about about my yeah. favorite story I should say from this yes. book I mean I've got many favorites so I shouldn't say yes. favorite but a wonderful <laughs> story yes that warms my heart um, when I think about it so a friend of mine in Sydney said to me, oh, her friend makes this amazing thing um, called a, um, she makes a binner stick and a strudel. I have to, can I actually check? Can I check? Can I check something? <laughs> Go for it. I've got to check, check something. I've just had like a mental blank, which is just terrible, but I have to look this up. And each book's in a different order, different yes. chapters set up. And I've got to look at the book and remember. Yeah, how this is, is in, This is in the order of people's names. So then you've got to think of their name. Okay? <laughs> That's impressive. Which honestly <laughs> is going to be too hard for me today. So just give me a minute to find <laughs> it. Um, oh yeah, I've got it. I feel like I should be in like a quiz show where they say, okay, yeah, what page <laughs> who did yes. the, <laughs> who what, did the Hungarian cheesecake? Who did the Hungarian cheesecake? No, 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 I do know here we go. Yep. Okay, that's right. Yes, it was finished at Kindler. That was the name I was thinking of. Yes. So she, a friend of mine told me she had um, a friend who made these two things called a binnerstick and Kindler. And Kindler is this incredible 
rolled strudel biscuit, mm -hmm. I'll call it. So it's like a little strudel, incredible, just flaky pastry with a filling of, wait for this, chocolate, nuts, jam, and dried fruit, okay? Really so you get that. like a hint of chocolate, the chewiness of the dried fruit, sweetness of jam, the crunch of the nuts, all in the pastry. It's just unbelievable. It's just an extraordinary recipe. So she gave me Lena's number and out of the blue, I called Lena and said, hi, it's Lisa Goldberg here. I'm doing, they're doing these books. And um, can I come see you about your recipe? She said, sure, come on over. So Lena was probably at that time um, 90. Wow. And um, so I went to visit her in her home and she invited me in and we sat down and she makes, offers me a cup of tea. Of course I say yes. And we sit down and she brings this big bowl of biscuits oh. to the table and we sit down and you know we start chatting and she sort of plies me with biscuits and tea and <laughs> biscuits and tea. I mean, you know, how good. Um, but then she tells me her life story and she's a survivor. Mm -hmm. um, she was born in Poland. She went through the war in Warsaw in an underground bunker. Um, you know, this in sort of that much space and, yeah. and coming out at night for, for some walking time and whatever. But the most harrowing of years. And I'm sitting there having just met her and hear this story and feel so, um, like it's really quite an honour yeah. to be told that Absolutely. story by someone who went through it. Yeah. And so I sat there and listened and <laughs> ate biscuits and drank tea and we sort of talked about it. And I said, oh, you know, you were just so courageous she said no no don't don't ever call me courageous call mm. me lucky um and and i that's always stuck with me yes um and at the end of the two hours of talking she said okay come back next week and i'll show you the recipes <laughs> oh wow. so the next week i went back again and she then cooked her two oh, wow. things for me and the funniest thing and i love to tell this story is that when she measured I can't get over this. When she measured her sour cream, they were the days when sour cream was in a carton, yes. not in a plastic tub. Yes. And she needed um, 150 grams or whatever it was. She took the carton, a serrated knife, and cut through the carton <laughs> in half, and that's how she measured her sour cream. <laughs> and the other thing she had, which I was also think about, is when recipes that need egg yolks. Um, um, you know, whenever I use an egg white for something, I put the egg yolk in the fridge or the other way around. And then after three days, I'm like scared that it's gone off and I'll toss it out. I was just going to say, I do the same thing and after three days, I throw it bowl Her out. egg yolks were like solid, like jelly oh, almost. Yeah. Fine. Fine. <laughs> I think we worry too much. We worry too much. Oh, the milk went off yesterday. Yeah, I can't exactly. drink it. What do you think it woke up and said I'm off today? So she, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So she baked these biscuits and I sat there and I'm like, like watching them in the oven. I said, ready, ready. Said, no, be patient, be patient. <laughs> And she brings out these beautiful, beautiful things that just fill my heart with joy. And I still make them. So Lena passed away, I, I think, at 99. Did she make 100? Maybe she made 100, actually. And just maybe five years ago or four years ago. And so I feel so yeah. honoured and privileged to have sat in her kitchen yes. to, her, to have heard her story and to we have her recipes now. Because I'm imagining for the most part you didn't, Get, that the person wasn't getting the opportunity to bake or make their food for you. They were passing on a recipe and it yes. was up to you to always. translate. Um, Pretty much really. always that yeah. was the case. Because, again, you think what gets lost in translation. I mean, were so there times much. where you went, what's special about this recipe? It's pretty ordinary. Or so I'm not getting it. No, it's really hard yes. because we, we had in one of the books, we had a granddaughter of, of this woman come to us and say that her grandmother is the best cook mm -hmm. and she makes an amazing this, this and this. And one of the things was a curry. And I had the recipe and I tried it and I was like, mm, no, it's just not doing it right. Yeah. And I thought I must have done something wrong, which is always my first thought. Yes. Make it again. No, give it to the girls. Girls, what do you think? Can someone try this? The granddaughter says it's really great. Anyway, mm. no, no, couldn't get it to work. So I, I ring, ring her up and I said, look, I just don't understand. Is there any way you can bring your grandmother over? I lived in Sydney. So she came over with her grandmother. We had the most <laughs> amazing day. Firstly, she brings the curry recipe. It's like totally different. Totally oh, different. Oh, like, <laughs> like such important things missing. Yeah. Um, not on purpose, just because you know. Because the there are other chefs that do it on I purpose. Know, I know. <laughs> and I, I so yeah. she made it with us. So totally it was worked. fantastic. Uh, but yes. then she showed us some other things that needed, um, you know, that special touch or that yeah. special thing. Yes. We did lots of video videoing yeah. of people, uh, and that's what I tell people when they. I often get asked, you know, what 
how do we preserve recipes from our own family? Mm. And I say it's not enough to get the recipe. It's not mm. enough to to watch someone make it. You need to video yeah. them. You need to go and make it yourself. You need to see where you went wrong. You need to do it again. You need to cook with them. It's so hard if you don't do that to yes. get it right. Yes. Uh, we've got another recipe in here um, from Nan. Her mate, we called her Nan Babes. She's also since passed away. My friend, um, Nikki's grandmother. And Nan Babes was this tiny little sparrow of a woman, gorgeous personality, who was famous for her caramelised almonds called Nana's Nuts. Mm -hmm. And also she made that pastilla, which is the, yeah. the log of prune and walnut. Mm -hmm. And so she made them for us. Now, I don't think the family had actually made them with her. Oh, so it's so they, they always She always yeah. made them for, made for, them for them. them. So we stood with her, this tiny little woman, this giant pot of yes. prunes, stirring, like it was quite hard to stir, yes. and watched and we filled a video of it and we made it and it was an extraordinary time. And now her, like she passed away a few years later and now she lives on through, yeah, the, through the brook. And that's, that's just it's, incredible. It's, it's, and at, and at her funeral, um, like the eulogy talked about her cooking, cooking and how she was so thrilled and how her family are so thrilled mm. to have it now recorded. Um, and that, that fills me with the greatest of joy. The fast forward, you know, to your fourth book, yeah. the process you must have learned a heap mm. along the way and you must have looked back by the fourth book and looked back at the first and said, I can't believe we did it like that. Um, was it a much smoother more efficient process or the more you know the more complicated it gets yeah uh, you know options. it took us each book took us three years yeah um which tells me that we never got any faster or better at it <laughs> i don't know maybe you some things take less time mm -hmm. but other things you become more pedantic about other things and we yes. did become um you know if you're going to pick my negatives of which there are many but one of them is that I'm too pedantic sometimes about okay. things that perhaps aren't that important yeah. but we used to like focus on just every word and everything mm -hmm. and every element to yes. such a degree it just takes too much time yes. and when you look back at the books and some of them just it just didn't really doesn't really matter that much if that yeah. color is that or that yes. or you know, but wording is <laughs> wording's a tricky one because there are people that will no doubt have used or referenced the books and they have a feel for cooking and they'll understand the process. And, yep, yep, chuck that in, do that, do that. And there are others that will follow it by the letter and say, now I'm just going to cut a little bit. Do you think that's the right size? Is that, you know, is this a full cup or, or, or like, do I need to top it up? And I think that's the difficulty in an yeah, audience yeah. that's so diverse. Well, that's what we tried to do and we, and we do pride ourselves on this, but even still it's not perfect mm. even though I'm always looking for perfection yeah. is that we want every anybody to be able to pick up a book yes. and make one of the recipes mm. without without any difficulty yeah. but you know you can't you can't do you can't see how everybody reads it True. we tried our hardest unless mm. you want a four page recipe for each recipe yeah, you can't do it you can't do it so we did our best but what we did learn by the end is that we should do things in grams and that's mm. something that I'm really yes um stuck on is that when you're baking don't use cut measurements. Yes. Um, your reference to that just reminded me. Yes. You know, weight, like if you weight, use a scale, yes. a scale, different. you can't make a mistake. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whereas a cup of flour, if, if, if we all yes. measured a cup of flour, weight it'll a cup of flour, it would be different. Mm -hmm. And so for baking, scales are the thing. Yes. Um, but we, the fourth book was probably the easiest, I think because of everything we'd learnt along the way. Mm -hmm. And that's our sweet book. Yes. And I, I love it. I mean, I love them all. Yeah, but sweet. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I can relate. <laughs> that's always the easiest or the, yeah, the, the way you, yeah. you guide it. People love it. And have you found over the, over the course of those years that you get people referencing, not one clearly, but you know, a, a particular recipe or, or a few recipes where they've really resonated with people, where you hear all the time, whether it's at Simnus or whatever, that, that there's always a recipe that people keep coming back to say, oh, I just love that one recipe. Yeah, I think I think in every book there's there's a few recipes yeah. that people come back to. I'm actually going to do a survey on, on social media over the next few weeks to find out which are piece, people's favourite recipes because mm. I really want to know. Mm. Um, and if I had to pick a few that, that I think resonate the most, it's hard to say because it's... <sighs> Different people, different things. But mm. I think um, probably the chiffon cake. Yeah. If I had to say one thing that I think represents Monday Morning Cooking Club, it might be the chiffon cake, mm -hmm. which is why in our fourth book we've got a 
whole chapter on chiffon, including a how-to step-by-step. Oh, so if you're not a chiffon, you should you're not a chiffon baker. Because mm-hmm. chiffons are hard yeah. if you don't know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. But they're not really hard once you've done once it. You know it but... but you've got to, if you don't follow the steps, it's just mm-hmm. not going to work. Yeah. And so people write to me and say, oh, I'm a chiffon cake. Because the chiffon cake, for those who don't know, it's it's, it's lightened by egg whites. And so it rises really high in the oven and then you bring it out and you turn it upside down to cool to let gravity help keep it high. And sometimes, you know, one in every, for me, it's probably one in every 20 now. Always the one that's for someone else. Falls out of the tin. If you undercook it the tiniest bit, Mm -hmm. I'm talking two minutes, it can fall out. So people write and say it fell out. Or you know, the recipe doesn't wrong. know and sprays the tin first and you never ever That's spray right. the exactly. chiffon tin. Exactly. So there's, or uses a non-stick one, which I don't yes. understand why they even sell them, but that's another yeah. story. Yes. Um, so <laughs> the chiffon cake probably is, is probably the number one thing. Have you, how did you end up, you know, when the books, the books came out and I don't know if everybody was like me, but if I heard the new one had come out, I was racing to get it. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> they sit proudly and well used on my shelf. Um, but after a period of time, you seem to become the face of Monday Morning Cooking Club. Was that intentional? Was that by plan or you fell into that? I don't know. It just sort of, <laughs> it just sort of organically happened. Mm-hmm. Um, I was I was always, well, I was not always, I was sort of the... the um, Chairperson, shall we call it? But they called me the, the chief pot stirrer. So I was always the chief pot stirrer of the cooking club. Mm-hmm. And so it was sort of like, um, you know, I was like directing a lot of it. And so mm-hmm. then that evolved as, as people went in and out of jobs and different times in their life. I was the one who was sort of there and doing the work. Um, I mean, everyone was contributing, mm-hmm. but it sort of just became over the years. I guess I became more of the face of it, particularly on social media. I yes. think I think that's yes. when it changed because yes. you can't three, you know, four, five, six people can't run can't a social media thing, yeah. and someone has to do it. Yeah. And I was the one who was interested in social media, although it is it, that when yeah, it really is, yes. it really is. It's a, it's a black and, hole that you don't often want to go into. And I think in in if I think back to seeing you on social media, COVID was really that period of time. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So just before COVID, so I was doing, I've been doing, the, always done the Instagram for Monday morning and the Facebook and the YouTube and all of that. And it became like, you know, I was doing it as a group, which is sort of a weird thing as a person to be a group. Yeah. So I was speaking as the group and checking with everybody. Can I post that? Can we say this? What do you think? And um, and then over the years, it sort of evolved to, oh, it was just me doing it. And I, and I didn't really know if I was me or a group. And yes. it was a little bit of a, a, a personality crisis for a while. And then... COVID hit mm. and during COVID I had the opportunity to um, or I took the opportunity to cook online on Instagram mm. and it was it actually is the thing that got me through the lockdowns yes. and I don't even want to talk to you Melbourne people about lockdowns because I know no, but, you did it so but you would have, hard you would have had a really you know, big Melbourne yeah, audience because yeah. it was something to look forward yeah. to yeah um, and I'm sorry you guys did it so tough you know we, we had it a lot easier in Sydney but we still had our moments yeah. and this Instagram live that I did actually helped me. So it was in the second year of COVID, and I when when the government announced a two week lockdown, I think it was the first one. I, I stood up on Instagram and I said, "Okay, everyone, I promise you, I'm going to do one recipe a day during lockdown." And I didn't know the lockdown was going to last three months. <laughs> did I? It couldn't but have said I, any Melbourne. <laughs> but I wanted to, you know, stick to my word, and yeah. so I got into it. We had this audience that we created, this mm-hmm. community. That was beautiful. And we knew each other and it was like, oh, hi. Oh, hi, you're on. Hi, Lisa. Hi, this one. Everyone knew everyone. Mm-hmm. People chatted amongst themselves. Yeah. Friendships were forged. Um, and people sent me things. Like, it was the it was the most beautiful thing. I mean, I'm not talking about I wanted gifts from it, but I'll tell you two funny things. So, in one episode, I drink that cinnamon, that cinnamon whiskey. It's yes, called all the kids um, drink it. Fireball. Um, yeah, exactly. Fireball. <laughs> and two ladies from... Perth sent me a giant <laughs> bottle oh. of Fireball plus their the recipe book they'd made for their family, oh. their family recipes. Like, how beautiful, beautiful. is that? Yeah. And for me to have touched people like that was mm-hmm. incredible. And the other one was um, a, a girl who has since become a friend. She was is a flight attendant with Qantas and she was always in lockdown, always in a hotel room, always. It was terrible. And I was part of her... Um, I guess the coping mechanism that she used to get through it, she would watch the videos and interact and whatever. And, and I just felt really sorry for her. It was a really tough time mm. for a lot of people like that 
in those industries and we became friends and she sent me a Qantas apron and I, oh. I just I wear it now all the time and I remember that friendship and we've become you know I, I talk to her a bit and she's a great girl um did you find um I mean yes it would have been therapeutic for you yeah, too yeah did that push you out of your comfort zone though to be sitting in front of the camera yeah. cooking also I mean and I'm probably probably projecting my own um insecurity of okay, am I doing this right? Am I projecting the right messages? Um, is the recipe yeah, coming across yeah. clear? Am I engaging? Am I, you know, how do you get it's past sort of, that? It's, it's, I don't know. I don't even know how it happened. Mm. I don't even know how it started and how I was comfortable, but I mm. felt very connected to the people there. And in the beginning, I was probably a bit more awkward than towards the end when they became like my friends. But what I, I still find today, like if you ask me to do a live, a mm. live Instagram, Instagram live and make some cookies and I'll do mm. it and it's fine but if you ask me to do a video for you of me making the cookies mm. I'll do like 3,000 retakes and I didn't yes. like that word and I didn't like that word so it's sort of different because when mm. you're live you can say oh I didn't mean to say that and yeah, say you can make your mistakes but when you're filming a video you think you can't actually mm -hmm. do it like that I, like I so my video so I filmed a video actually yesterday which I'm going to put out soon for a chicken salad. Okay. So I just got just got back and I'm a bit jet lagged and not, my head's not quite screwed on right <laughs> at the moment. And I did this video, honestly, and I'm gonna publish it as it is. I've done a bit of editing, but not too much. Where I, it's like, <laughs> it's like the real me. I'm feeling like this is like my, gonna be my coming out video um, where I, I, I'm not efficient. I'm not that organised. I burnt my onions. I spent half the video debating with myself on camera. Should I keep the onions? Should I cook another one? But that's so what real. People think? can relate to And that. then I stand there just eating all the burnt ones. Yeah. Saying, anyway, it's so real. And I've watched it a couple of times during the editing and I'm thinking, well, I'm going to do it. Yeah. That's just me. But I, I've, I've become used to talking to an audience. It's become... Yes. A joy for me now I mean in the beginning I was you know don't think I've always been like this yeah. you know I was um, I was a solicitor in my past life yeah. and I was used to go to court and I used to literally shake mm -hmm. um, and be very nervous and even when I you know got, first got married and used to have to speak to you know give a talk I was always nervous yes so it, it's something that over time I've learned to do and you're doing what you love yeah which makes a big yeah. difference yeah but it's, it's, it's I, I, I am really aware of, of how someone can change yes I, I did a radio interview a couple of weeks ago and i went in on my own and it was fine and i had yes. tiny little butterflies but just the normal i remember my first radio interview with the girls i was i wanted to be sick i was so nervous yeah and they had a video of it as well and i was like swinging in this chair the whole time. <laughs> and it just shows you like i, I want to like say to myself and to anyone like you can change, like you, you can just be, you be scared of something and actually then overcome it. And, and that's and I love that feeling of seeing the difference of where you've come. Mm. Okay, so I love this current I don't know if it's current, it feels current for me. This this new spot in your life where I can call you a YouTuber. I love, <laughs> I love that. So you're now you've just finished a series of is it 10? Yeah, ep 10, 10 episodes yeah. Um, called Walking Up an Appetite. Yeah. For those that haven't seen it, you've got to check it out on YouTube. It's fantastic. Um, I'm thinking it's got to get picked up by somebody outside of YouTube. I'm waiting. Yes, it's really fun. I love the concept behind it. Thank you. What was the impetus behind that? The impetus behind that was my life um, and what I love to do. Um, and you know, all through these books and everything, what I love to do the most is eat. Okay, that's my number one thing. I love to eat, and I love to talk about eating and what I eat. And I love to tell people, you know, what I ate and where they should eat and, and when they go and eat there, you know, what they should do on the way and how they should get there. Like, so it's mm. not just the eating, it's the whole experience around the food that I love to share. And during, um, after the Instagram lives, I sort of got this new confidence of talking to an audience. So that was mm -hmm. part of it. But I also went on a walk one day with my daughter, Jessie, um, during lockdown when we had all those stupid rules and whatever. And we decided to do this thing which we called the pastry walk. And we went to three um, places and we ate a different pastry at each one. And we just said, oh, I just said to her, you know, Jessie, we should do something with this. This is a great concept of eating a similar thing in different places and walking at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that was the other C. Okay. Um, so those two things together. And it was sort of the end of Monday Morning Cooking Club at that time in the sense that we'd done our four books. Mm -hmm. 
we really weren't burning to collect anymore. We sort of told the story of the community and we were happy to let it sit for the moment. Mm -hmm. um, we had in our mind that maybe one day we would do a best of, but you know, yeah. nothing at the moment. So I thought this is a time. So I got in touch with a lady, um, she's a um, producer and filmmaker who reached out to us to do a Monday Morning Cooking Club show. Right. We always wanted to do a Monday yeah. Morning Cooking Club show. Fantastic. We tried with three, three different producers approached us mm -hmm. over the years and did some videos and pictures to all the networks and nobody wanted it. It just was not, there was no interest at all there, which was really, really, really disappointing. You were probably ahead of your time. I don't know. It's real. I think it would have made a great, a great show. Great yeah. all the stories. You know, we, we did yes. many iterations of this show, and yeah. it just was no one was interested. So I finally gave up on that. Well, sort of. Sort of. <laughs> it's probably yeah. Yeah. like if someone calls me now and says, "Do you want to do a show?" Yeah. I'm there. Um, and I called her and I said, "Let's have a coffee." And I told her about the show. And so I engaged her as a consultant because mm -hmm. I didn't know. I had no idea. I wanted to do a show. I wanted to do a show that shared what I love to do, mm -hmm. um, eating, walking, talking, discovering new things, cooking. I wanted all that in a show, but I had no idea. Forget having no idea how to do a book. I really had no <laughs> idea how to do this or even where to start. So I knew I needed help, which is actually a, a, probably the best thing I've done is knowing that, that, that I couldn't do it myself. Yeah, and find some And so we had a coffee and I told her what I wanted to do and she came up with I said that. And... Um, we started working together and talking about all possibilities of how this show could look. I mean, we did a whole circle around the whole world of possibilities, ended up in all sorts of weird places and came back, back at the original idea. And she found, you know, she was researching the right people and we found this great guy director. Um, his name's Mike Cardillo. He does a lot of food shows. He's really well known in the industry. And we invited him over for a meeting at my place and he turns up. And sorry, one of the pastries I should go back that Jesse and I ate was a sfogliatelle, which is an Italian pastry that looks like a lobster or a hedgehog with um, has different fillings. It's punchy and it's delicious. And um, he turned up to the meeting with a tray of oh. sfogliatelle. <laughs> and he walked in and went, yeah, yeah. like, seriously, like this is the sign. Yeah. This is the sign. And he loves food. I'm going to say maybe more than me. Oh, no, it's possible. Maybe more than me. <laughs> Um, so we started talking to him and he was interested and so we decided to film a pilot. Okay. And that's it. We, we sort of wrote this, he wrote the script, we wrote it, we, we sort of worked on it together. Mm. We worked out how the first show was going to look and we filmed it in Bondi last, so June a year ago. Yeah. And we then watched it and critiqued it and showed it to a few people and sort of fine tuned it a bit and then thought, let's do a whole season. Okay. So I did 10 episodes of Walking Up an Appetite, um, which takes me around all of Greater Sydney. So I try to go not just the eastern suburbs, as much as hard as it is to leave Bondi and um, Newtown, because you can find everything you need there. I did venture out um, to the north, to the west, to the mm -hmm. south, everywhere. And the, the aim of the show is to pretty much walk at least 10 k's each episode. Yes. Um, to eat three of the same dish, versions of the same dish at different places, to meet the people behind the dishes, to meet, learn the story behind that dish, a bit of history, fun facts along the way, and then come home and cook something inspired by that. So yes. that's the show. Yes. It's supposed to be 15 minutes, and that's what we were trying to do. Um, and it's hilarious that you call me a YouTuber because um, I'm so far from a yeah, YouTuber. I know, that's I, know I know. And I, and I would love to be a YouTuber, but I just don't think it's me. And, and I spend my hours now watching people on YouTube and think, how do they even do it? Like, how do they... Yeah, but it's also a rabbit hole. How do they do it? And so I don't really want to be a YouTuber. Okay. What I want... I put it on YouTube because where else do you put your yeah. show to be seen without a network? Mm -hmm. And I didn't go down the network path. I didn't want to pitch and have to bring the advertising. I wanted to make the show I wanted to make. Yeah. Um, I had someone to fund it, so I didn't need to worry about that. And then I could do it exactly as I wanted. And the dream, of course, is that it sits on YouTube, everyone watches it, and then someone goes, ah. Oh, Someone's got to pick it up. I'm going to yeah. pick this up. Yeah. Um, and so that's where I am. So... We've got like a, you know, we've got 2,000 subscribers, we've got nearly 4,000 watched hours, which is quite a big thing on YouTube. So it's doing quite well for a new channel. The channel name is now Hey Lisa Goldberg. We yes. changed it. Yes. Um, and I'm sitting there waiting. 
and having waiting. fun along the way. For someone. You, um, you do it. And and also doing cooking videos, which I love yes. doing, yes. and um, keeping the social media going. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's fun. So my last question, I guess, would be, what's next? I mean, you're travelling, so I guess that is inspiring you. Yeah, travelling's inspired me so much. Um, I must say, this year, the food, uh, the things that I've eaten, like I've made notes in my in my book about what I want to cook and what I want to learn to cook and what I want to master. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to set my sights on that. And yes. then, of course, I'll share it with everybody. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a little bit of rumbling happening happening in the Monday Morning Cooking Club camp. Right. Um, you know, we, we've always wanted to do a best of, which mm -hmm. would be a book for the new generation. Cause I feel like we've got four books, one and four are still in print, two yep. and three are out of print so okay. they, and they won't be reprinted. So, okay. uh, I know. So, so many people of the next generation, like our kids generation won't have access to them. And that they're now at the point that and they, they need them. be using them. Yeah. So if we do something, it will be, it will be a sort of a best of and for the new generation combo book. So okay. that's what possibly okay and i'm just still sitting here waiting for someone to pick up my show Before and jump on next series. to make the next season because i would like to do um some more of them i just i'm thinking melbourne i was gonna say <laughs> <laughs> there's got to be a pool to, to I'm melbourne thinking or... melbourne because i'm very connected to melbourne yes. still yes um having lived here you know yeah just under half my life um but who knows well, we look forward to seeing what is next and, and what else comes out of the kitchen. I've loved chatting to you yeah, and, and, thank and you. my pleasure. Thank you. And um, yeah, we look forward. I'm sure I'm not the only one who will be referencing the books for Rosh Hashanah um, and making some of these beautiful traditional recipes, maybe with a modern twist. Mm. But thank you. Yeah, thank you.